War in Angola is one of the aspects of a conflict which has kept unstable a huge African region under Cuban, East German and Soviet domination. Countering this alien presence on an already volatile continent are dozens of South African army patrols like this one, moving on foot and often raging for hundreds of kilometers at a stretch without any outside source of support. Compact, independent of supply, and totally self-contained for survival and defense, these are the men that have struck terror into many a stout heart. For these white officered black soldiers are the seasoned veterans of a decade of unconventional warfare. They fought first against Lisbon's legions during the late 60s and early 70s. Now it's against the Soviet Union and its African cohorts. Today their role in the war is to scout for evidence of Swapu terrorists, the same movement which has threatened to remove South African presence from Namibia by force of arms and which operates primarily from Angolan soil. Much of the movement inside this hostile terrain is restricted to earlier and later parts of the day. Long experience has taught these soldiers that activity during the hours when the sun reaches its peak can be counterproductive. All considerations essentially narrow down to the availability of water or whatever other liquid might be available. It's then that the major meal of the day might be prepared. Most times, this consists of standard issue food of the type that is universally known in South Africa's operational area as rat packs. <laughs> Back at base, the pace slows noticeably until the next phase of the operation is reached. Officers and men of all races mix easily, their dress and demeanor reflecting the rugged bush life to which the majority are subjected, for this is an elite call. On patrol, the men might be required to work in the same set of clothes for a month, without once being able to wash their faces. Always, white officers and NCOs black their faces in exposed parts of their body. Angola is a black man's country, where history has proved the white a transient, even though the Portuguese held it for five centuries. We are now in South Angola, a country that the Portuguese often term Teresh de Fum Mundo, the land at the end of the earth. It's here where the South Africans have taken the war to the enemy. They send in search and destroy teams in order to take out Swapu terrorists. These people are preparing for an operation. We've caught them at the last moment on the ground just before they're about to take off. Among them are quite a few illustrious war heroes, including one of them, Corporal Koshta, who recently was awarded one of the highest medals in the South African Army, the Honoris Crooks. He achieved his role in an attack several years ago, in which he brought out 12 wounded. Captain Jules here is a 25-year-old South African Army captain, uh, serving with this Special Forces team. And how long have you been in the bush? I've been in the bush now, just over a month. And how do you live when you are on your own like that? Do you have support from the South Africans' uh, supply? Yes, we do have support from South African supply. If we don't get support, we get our own food. What is that? Oh, we get some buck, which is kudu. And what do you do for water? Oh, we sometimes dig for it, and sometimes we can get it from the local pops, uh, which we get, uh, they call it the kashima, which is in fact a water hole. The availability of water lies at the core of every single operation launched by South Africans in this region. Without it, no one would survive more than a day, for it's a sun-seared land, blistered by years of drought. The operation must bring in its train anything else that might be needed like food, ammunition, batteries for radios, medical equipment and even the rare luxury like milk in cartons. Prior to the launching of the operation, all supplies are stockpiled, ready for disposal as and where required. Fuel too has to be taken in, in drums, enough to keep several squadrons of aircraft operational during a crisis. Like the rest, these supplies are taken in by helicopter. Many of the men comprising this force are veterans by the time they are 20. You're in the bush on your 21st birthday. Where were you when you turned 20, Lieutenant Richard? I was last year in the bush at the same time when I was 20, as well as last Christmas and New Year. So you basically had two years of operations with this unit? Basically, it's going now, ending my second year this year. Are you going to stay in the army? Yeah, I'm staying. I'm in permanent force at this stage. You like it? I like it. It's got a good life. What is the attraction? What is it that you that you feel about it? At this stage, it's just the nature, fresh air, and the bush, and the war itself, which is obviously why you are here. There's no other choice. I mean, you've got to do the job. 
from you must be them. What part of the operations are you involved in? It's just the cleaning up operation, sweeping. Inside Angola? Inside, just inside Angola and we work uh, internal as well. Do you have your share of contacts in this war? We have, our first, we have our first half contacts, you can go a few days, we get absolutely nothing. Other days you have your luck. What do you consider luck? The luck is when the day you get, you get your contact and you get your few kills in your contact. Does this involve a great deal of follow-up? Yes, it does, does. Definitely does, because you... Follow-up is not just an easy task. Some, some days you must run at least 20... You say anything between 6 and 20 k's on a follow-up, see what you get. Following the patrols, the main strike force will enter an area, and here, on day one, the task force commander will outline the nature and extent of the operation. The possible position of the Northern Front headquarters of Swapu <coughs> is in that vicinity, around about 7 to 8 kilometers northeast of Wanjiwa. There will be three to 400 terrorists in that base, as well as the command structure of the northern front of Swapu. As in the past and as normal, we will have nothing to do with the MPLA forces except if they interfere with our operation with against Swapu, which at this stage we doubt very much. The mission then is we must locate and attack the northern front headquarters in that specific area and after that we must do an area operation in the normal area of the Northern Front from north towards the south with a cut line over there. First operations are obviously well planned and coordinated. This particular strike involved nine separate and identifiable phases spaced over about two weeks. Every contingency was catered for, including involvement by Soviet-backed elements, which was in fact to take place shortly afterwards during Operation Protea. To take maximum equipment and weapons from the enemy or to destroy that equipment of the enemy. And then fourthly, to disrupt the command and control system of the Northern Front headquarters. Every war spawns its crop of surprises, or for that matter, lack of them. Then the men wait. In this case, it took the unit almost a week to make a sizable contact. Intelligence reports which had been accurate a month before were outdated by the time that Operation Carnation, as this strike was known, was launched. One day rolled into another, and the men did the best they could to make themselves comfortable in the sparse bush country of South Angola. It's times like this that are dreaded by operational commanders. For even though there is no activity, security has to be maintained at the highest and most efficient level possible. The camp has to be guarded around the clock against attack, a possibility which exists in any combat region. For this, the men dig in. At night, they sleep in prepared positions, like these. For some of us, it's almost a prelude to a fate that ultimately awaits us all. Nightfall in the African bush is always a magnificent spectacle, even in an Angola wracked by war. It's what the next day promises that presents the contrasts. The bulbous aqui. Nós lo vemos as you know, son. Você é nosso protetor e salvador. Amen. Okay, good luck for the operation. Best. Must go well. Okay. <coughs> The first wave is airlifted out even before it's light. The rest of the strike force, whether cleaning a rifle or just standing by, wait for the helicopters to return and the brief journey that might take some of them to glory or to eternity. Faces are tense. Most reflect the enthusiasm of youth, even in wartime. For these are the young men that fight South Africa's wars.
divided into sticks, the men scattered to predetermined aircraft which will carry them to their destinations and hopefully action. For though they might become a statistic in the course of the morning's events, few of these battle-hardened soldiers would hope for a lemon as an aborted operation is colloquially termed. A big external operation like this one might involve several strike forces, some of them originating concurrently on South West African soil. For many of the black troops, this is also a brother's war, some fighting with, some against. And while they went to board, a sergeant who was born in Angola and who has spent years fighting Portuguese imperialism briefs his men. He uses the only language he knows, Portuguese for it is something of a lingua franca in this desolate corner of Africa. Like the others, these men are intent on action, for theirs is a war of deed, not of word. Then they go in. From a dozen points on the compass, the strike force lifts off. Few of the men carry more than their rifles, spare ammunition clips and water, for most will be back at base before nightfall. Each will have a story to tell. In truth, the measure of a man's worth on this continent is his ability to cope in times of adversity, even in wartime. Occasionally, ground forces will have an armor backup, such as when several task forces recently struck at an array of Swapu bases adjacent to Ongiva and Jangongo during August this year. For this purpose, the South Africans have developed an incredibly versatile infantry fighting vehicle known as the Rattle, the Afrikaans' word for the fiery little African honey badger of Robert Ruark fame. These vehicles, designed for mobile warfare, have proved adept at tackling most of the problems encountered in the kind of war in which the South Africans now find themselves, including the threat of enemy armour. It's no secret that during Operation Protea, Rattles, acting in concert with Irland armoured cars, knocked out several squadrons of Soviet-built T-34 and PT-76 tanks without the loss of a single vehicle of their own. Multi-crewed and with a gearbox the size of the average Volkswagen car, the rattle can traverse any kind of terrain. Literally, it is able to plow its way through the densest South Angola forest. That attack occurred at sunset. We went in the following morning at first light. The sight that greeted us was awesome. Later that day, the first wounded survivors were brought in. Like this youngster, who was found some distance from the Swapu camp, lucky to be alive. He had been caught in a crossfire in a subsequent skirmish with an enemy unit. Brought back from the brink of death by the unit doctor, who, 
like others in the Special Forces unit, is airborne trained for any eventuality, the youngster's condition was first stabilised. Then his leg was bound and he was Kazavak back to South African lines for treatment. The sweep which resulted from the initial contacts covered a vast area of open bush country. For nearly a kilometre, the sweep line followed the contour of bush and burn grass, evidence of the previous day's hostilities. There was only one overriding consideration. The men needed to watch for landmines or booby traps. And we found them. A telltale wire sticking through the sand told our left flank that there was something there. It was a job for the engineers to sort out. With the kind of experience gained from much practice, the young lieutenant sifted carefully through the soil to ascertain the extent of the trap which we found covered a fairly substantial cache of Soviet arms. Still not satisfied, he connected a grappling iron to more wires. From a safe distance, the engineers pulled while we waited for an explosion, which never came. The entire cache area had been mined for just such an eventuality, with the business end of the bomb covered in plastic against the vagaries of weather. The cache itself yielded its share of surprises. Landmines from Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, bundles of East German detonators exposed and unstable, Czech cheese mines, so named because they resemble bright yellow cheeses. Throughout the secondary operation, we were provided with air cover, though on that occasion we didn't need it. And once completed, the sweep went on, hour upon hour, in search of more swapped caches of explosives and weapons. The work was tedious and exacting, as it is each time there's an external strike, but it has to be done. Above the whine of a battalion of insects and flies, the only friendly sounds come from above. The camp itself, once we reached it, was a daunting proposition. Kilometre after kilometre of twisting trenches and buried bunkers. There was no way of telling whether any or all had been booby-trapped. Obviously the enemy had fled, leaving little of value behind except clothing, some ammunition, documents and the primitive paraphernalia of survival in an equally primitive land. When the engineers weren't certain of the security of a particular position, they employed their own means to find out where the danger still lurked. This swap of camp was hit by the Parabats last night. The Parabats are the South African version of American Airborne. They came in at dusk and they withdrew half an hour later. The base itself extends over an area of about 20 football fields. It's huge. It's camouflaged. It typifies the sort of war that is being fought. It's not a sophisticated installation, but it's functional for the purpose of the kind of terrorism which is being waged into Southwest Africa. Swapu, it is said, never returns to one of their bases once it has been cleared by the South Africans. Possibly they fear that it might have been booby-trapped in turn. Every swap of camp yields its treasures. In this case, dozens of boxes of brand new Russian 82mm recoilless gun ammunition of a type that is being extensively deployed in several insurgent back conflicts throughout the globe. These include Lebanon, El Salvador, Chad, Afghanistan, Cambodia, and elsewhere. It's this kind of material which the Soviet Union pumps into an unstable region in a bid to foment revolution. While the rest of Angola starves, these boxes, each one containing four bombs, and together conservatively estimated in value at the price of a modest prefabricated cottage, have been transported through some of the most difficult country in Africa to be used in war. Undoubtedly, the finding of the cash must have been a serious blow to the revolutionary movement. Clearly, the South Africans will use this ammunition against the same enemy responsible for bringing it in in the first place. Irony certainly has a million faces.
Not all of the war material is new. Some had been buried in the sand for years. These mortar bombs are not only unstable, they are dangerous. Not the sort of weapon to use in a tight spot. The rest is brand new. It's this material, complete with Russian markings, that will be airlifted out of this remote region. For to leave it behind could result in it being used against the South Africans at a later stage. For this purpose, a fleet of helicopters is employed, bringing in fresh troops, provisions and water and taking out the spoils of war. Operating in a huge area, reckoned to be about half the size of France, these are the pack horses of the South African Air Force. Sometimes they loaded a fraction beyond the permissible limit, then this happens. Loading begins. The criterion being more or less whether the chopper will be able to lift off with this heavy load of munitions or not. To the air crews, it's often a thankless job, well done, and not without its risks. In truth, the helicopter pilots of the South African Air Force are the often unsung heroes of this war. These are the men required to move when the time comes. A troopie might be wounded at sunset, a hundred kilometers behind enemy lines. It's not even a question for debate whether a helicopter will go in or not to bring him out. That much is taken for granted. It's not unusual for some of these crews to work through the night during a crisis. I've been on operations with your forces in this operational area for three weeks, both here in northern South West Africa and South Angola. You've been fighting this war for 16 years. You've been here longer in conflict than the Americans were in Vietnam, and still you claim you're winning this war. Well, it's unreasonable and unfair to compare the two wars with each other. There are still conflicts. This is a very low-intensity war at this stage. It's a guerrilla war. The Americans lost approximately 50,000 men in Vietnam. And we, haven't, we haven't even lost 500 over a period of 16 years. Now how many are you losing now a year? The figure for 1980 was 75. And Swapu? And Swapu, 1,500, which gives you a ratio of 1 to 20, which is very good for this type of war. This is even better than the Rhodesian figures. Your conflict in this region revolves around the civilian population. My impressions are that Swapu is gaining a lot of support from the civilians, from the local population. The local population is forced to uh, support Swapu. They, they are do. intimidated by Swapu. I've, I've, I've shown you uh, various examples of churches and schools which were burned down. I've shown you examples of the local population which, is blown, which were blown up by landmines. They intimidate the local population by, uh, in this way, so they are forced to help Swapu. But the recruits come from the local population and the recruits must be willing. Well, they take the recruits out of the country. They don't go voluntarily. I must say, uh, to a certain extent, a very low percentage is v uh, voluntarily. But the great number is forced to leave Southwest Africa and Namibia. Brigadier, if Angola was to withdraw its support, what would the situation be in this war? The war is going to terminate immediately. For because what reason? If, because if Swapu 
haven't got base areas to operate from, then they can't operate. If they haven't got the support of the Angolans, the Russians, the East, East Germans, the Cubans, and all the other uh, um, Eastern Bloc countries, then they can't fight this war. So the war goes on. For as long as the new brand of communist imperialism fuels the fires of despair on an already desperate continent, there will be conflict. Thank you.